Hello, and welcome to today's sports and fitness webinar. I'm Mary Ellen Shoup, Senior Correspondent for Food Navigator USA, and we're here to talk more about what's happening in this booming category, including what are some of the major consumer trends driving growth in the category? Is protein still the main ingredient when we talk about sports and fitness products, or are there other ingredients that we should be paying more attention to? What flavors are consumers gravitating towards? And how has the retail landscape for sports and fitness products evolved? Also, what does today's sports and fitness consumer look like? Where are they shopping? And how should brands be targeting them? I'm very happy to be joined by a panel of industry insiders who can answer these questions for us over the next 45 minutes or so. And then we'll be opening up the discussion to some Q&A from the audience. Thank you to the listeners who have already submitted questions and would just like to remind all of you tuning in right now that you can submit a question at any time during the webinar by simply typing your question in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Cargill, Nelson, Bruce Lowe, and Cluster Dextrin, and remind everyone that you can download the handouts found at the left-hand side of the screen. Now, let me introduce our fantastic panel, we have Tom Morgan, a sports and nutrition analyst from Lumina Intelligence, who is here to dig into some of the data and reveal some intriguing information about the sports and fitness category. Next, we have Joshua Shaw. He's the owner and president of Jay Shaw Consulting and a sports and fitness market guru who specializes in brand development and strategy. We have Jared Smith, a former collegiate and professional hockey player turned entrepreneur and co-founder of NUMA, a sports drink that's shaking up the category. We also have with us Mark Samuel, CEO of the fast-growing I1 Organic, a brand of protein-packed snacks including chips, sticks, and puffs that are going head-to-head -head with some traditional salty snack brands. And last but certainly not least, we have Mark Loebliner, owner and CEO of MTS Nutrition, which launched the Outright Bar, a whole food protein bar that's quickly gaining presence across retail channels including mass drug and convenience, Outside of running the business, Mark is also a professional bodybuilder, amateur boxer, and CrossFit Level 1 certified. Thank you all for joining us today, and I'm going to turn it over to Tom Morgan, who has some really great information with us, uh, for us to, to share with us. Hello there. Uh, thank you, Mary Ellen, for the introduction. If you're listening from the U.S., good morning from uh, Europe, good afternoon, and if you're listening from the APAC region, you're up really late, but thank you for tuning in. Uh, in this little introduction, I'll be briefly introducing the Lumina research so that everything makes sense. Um, and I'll just go over very quickly, Ooh, sorry, what slide are we on? <laughs> Before going into the nitty gritty of the market data and the trends shaping the scene. Uh, as this is Food Navigator, I'll be taking a bit more of a protein angle, um, you know, like with protein bars and protein powders. So, when, so first introductions. Uh, most people know how much of an influence the Internet is now having on the shopping experience, both on an online and offline uh, level. And in sports nutrition, it's no different. Uh, according to a survey conducted by Bayes of Voice in 2016, 59% of consumers checked online reviews before actually making an in-store purchase. Uh, the truth is society is moving away from mono-channel mono and are actually moving to the omni-channel experience. This is even changing how brands are selling. Some brands are no, lo uh, no longer, in fact, selling uh, to retailers, except they're selling directly to the consumer. Uh, probably the best example of that is my protein. Um, between uh, 2011 and 2018, sales for the brand increased 15-fold. This transfer to the online world is on a societal level. Clicks and likes are gaining a monetary value as we see brands pay thousands of influencers to endorse their products. As well as advertising is going down its own, is doing its own thing. So is word of mouth. Reviews and product scores are becoming an essential part of the buying experience for consumers as they try and pick their way between different variants and find what's best for them. So preliminary research from Lumina in its probiotics market has found that there's a strong link between reviews and online revenue for brands in the US. 
as shown in the chart here. Reviews charted on the bottom, revenue up the side, blobs representing the brands. We did analysis looking for links with multiple social media channels to find which had the strongest link. And it was reviews that actually had the uh, strongest correlation. I like to think it's because there's a direct relationship between purchase and a review. But anyway, with this, we can get a more granular look at what's happening in the market, not just on a brand and feelings level, but on a product and quantitative one. Um, I'll be referring to reviews sometimes as engagement as a good measure of where people are engaging, which basically leads to the Lumina proposition. Grabbing the best selling sports and nutrition products from the top nine online retailers of 20 different countries, we grab the product and review information of over 4,000 products and 2.4 million reviews. In this, we grab data on ingredients on a sort of like format level, uh, actual formats, flavors, claimed health benefits, price, clean labels, and most importantly, reviews. And whilst the animation is not working, you can imagine that all those shapes combined into this cow. Um, and it's all to give us a better look of what's happening in the market from a bottom-up approach. With this, you can grab details like the fact that uh, whey is still the most popular protein source in uh, protein powders, present in 69% of them. Or the fact that generic whey, not isolate, concentrate, or hydrolysate, is the highest consumer engagement whey format. This is on both a total level and an average level, meaning that there's still hunger in the market for it. And quite nicely, with our data, proof of concept truly came in when we did our first data update. So one other thing that we collect isn't just information on the products that are doing well, but also the products disappearing from the market. Um, also information on when the um, e-retailer drops them. And from what we found, the lowest scoring and lowest engagement products online got dropped the most often. Unsurprising, but it's a nice feather in our cap. You might notice the protein bars um, actually saw uh, higher glasses online. And this is largely due to the fact that they've become a healthy snack in the gore and more of impulse purchase. So if people are buying protein bars online, it tends to be more they're planning ahead. And then getting into the actual market overview, we find that there's been a 15% of uh, growth in online reviews between September 2018 and March 2019. And from all the over 4,000 products that we caught, the 6.4% are now no longer available. This indicates a market that is still getting on its feet uh, as products are being dropped and being brought on incredibly quickly. And product cycling and reformulating is going very fast. When looking at how these different products target, we can see that 41% of them uh, target athletes, the sort of mainstay of the sports nutrition scene. Um, except then when you look at the average engagement, shown on the graph on the right, with the average number of reviews and the average star rating, the products targeting the general audience are getting the most engagement. What can also be noted from this uh, graph is that women's products are really not performing well. They're getting significantly worse in reviews, both in score and in average number of reviews. And then, unsurprisingly, in sports nutrition, growth is largest in uh, protein powders. They get the largest number of reviews overall, and have registered a 23% growth in online reviews in that six-month period. This is then being followed up by pre-workout blends, which are beginning to tar uh, target and go into new demographics. We're finding that they're going on to store shelves with BCA drinks, and that they are trying to get e-gamers even involved, as they are a market that's very dedicated to uh, nootropics and the like. Then, when looking at the different health benefits that are actually doing well, we can see that sports nutrition is diversifying from its muscle-bound bodybuilder base. 
and that engagement is now moving towards digestive um, benefits, like digestive health and easy to digest and improving absorption, and even more niche ones like joint health. Uh, probably the nichest health benefits that we've found in sports nutrition so far uh, include things like mental health, which is a very buzzwordy uh, topic at the moment, and sexual health, um, which is just probably a discussion for another day. When looking at the types of things that are kicking off with flavors, the big things that get to people, it's nostalgia and novelty. They're key marketing flavors. Uh, probably the best example of that is uh, with Ghost, uh, with as they uh, made combinations with Chips Ahoy and Warheads. Except what's really interesting is in the American market, what's beginning to pick up with the flavor innovation are fresh flavors. Um, so if you think if you look at my protein, they've just released a clear protein to market because you can actually apply tropical flavors and more citrus flavors, which would normally contrast a bit too dramatically with um, the normal whey base. It should be noted, though, that the American market is very dominated by baked goods. So you see a lot of Rocky Road, you see a lot of caramel, waffles, cupcakes. And it's this sort of like base, childlike flavors that people are going to. And this extends even to the protein bar market. So when we've looked at the different formats of protein bars, which ones are getting the highest growth in engagement, and which ones have the most engagement? Obviously, the bar is the most popular product. It, um, still makes up the majority of the market, and it's the, one of the easiest ways that people can get into the market. But despite the fact that only 2.8% of bars are in cookie format, protein cookies are where the majority of growth is being seen, indicating that consumers are beginning to move away from the bar format into the more nuanced, interesting things that they haven't tried before. And also, they want to go back to their home comfort. So it's this merger of worlds. And uh, I know it's fairly short, but I thought that would be a good way to get into the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tom, for that. That was um, There are a lot of things that I'll be referencing back to there, because there are a lot of interesting insights that you uncovered. Um, just out of curiosity, as a follow-up, was plant protein anywhere in that at all? Was that, is that trailing far behind way right now? So when we've compared animal-based protein, plant-based, and mixed, um, it's very dependent on the market. So in America, mm -hmm. it is absolutely booming. Um, it's got massive growth. It's outperforming uh, animal-based protein in growth. Obviously, animal-based is still a majority of the market. But mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if in the next few years, just pops up as a the okay. majority. Um, and then in the EU, for instance, it's actually a lot slower being picked up. But I think that's because the uh, Europe normally trails behind American trends. Got it. Okay, well, that is good to know um, because, you know, we have, there are multiple sources of protein that uh, to consider when it comes to sports and fitness. Um, so I'm going to toss um, the first question out here to you, Joshua. Um, I wanted to take a look, go into the sports and fitness market on kind of a macro level. And just with your experience, you know, what did the market look like five to 10 years ago? And what have you noticed as the major evolution um, to today as far as consumer bases go, um, products, any big key changes there? Yeah, and one particular category, I think one that's going to come up um, often throughout this conversation is around protein bars. And I kind of looked at the market size in the U.S. Um, back in 2009, and it was only about a $1.5 billion uh, market. Now, uh, this year, 2019, I think it's estimated at somewhere around $6 billion. So it's about a 15% 
uh, compounded grant or annual growth rate on that. And if you think about 2009, 10 years ago, um, everything was, was different, I guess, in terms of what we think about the market today. So in terms of retail, it was very much focused on specialty um, physical stores. So GNC, vitamin shop, um, that's where you tended to get the most uh, of your products if it was a fitness or active type of, of product. And then that has obviously changed drastically in the last 10 years. Um, the customer base back in 2009 was just kind of starting to change its shape a little mm -hmm. bit, but you were still dominated towards um, very serious weightlifters and, and fitness goers that were buying these products. It wasn't at the point now where it's very much mainstream, very much lifestyle purchasers that are looking at um, the category as a whole uh, much differently. And then you had a fraction of the competition in terms of brand creation that you have today. So you didn't have as many of uh, the names and it wasn't as competitive. So the, just the total landscape has changed in the last 10 years. It's, it's quite drastic if you did take that 10 year um, leap because today it's just completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting to look at it from that perspective. And, um, you know, I just wanted to bring up, I guess, some more timely news about um, one of these major acquisitions of Simply Good Foods Company of um, Quest Nutrition for a billion dollars. You know, what does what do you think that means for the category um, of sports and fitness? I mean, I think for the category as a whole, I think first and foremost, it, it just adds validation to the categories. I think that um, sports and fitness, and, you know, whatever you want to kind of call that category had always been kind of stuck in a silo or, or kind of the um, redheaded stepchild to a lot of like bigger CPG or, or fast moving consumer good um, categories. But it has been a hub of, of trends and, and innovation for a long period of time. It's just never really gotten um, the right look. And now I think with the uh, tons of different acquisitions that have come with some of these uh, protein bar companies or just better for you type of healthier for you food and beverage um, brands. I think it's adding a ton of validation to the market, but it's one of these things where the mergers and acquisitions that happened um, in the last year is, is just going to, I think, accelerate because a lot of these portfolios are trying to reestablish their brand portfolios to get healthier for them and better for them. And right now, a lot of their legacy categories are kind of crumbling around them and they're struggling to find growth in the market as a whole, being that they're public companies, um, they're really driven on quarterly growth um, type of uh, expectations. And the only way to get that is through um, acquiring some of these higher growth brands that would be in high growth categories that are around this kind of fitness and health um, space. Yeah, and you know that kind of brings um, me to my next point here, and I'd love to get your perspective, Mark Lobliner. It was suggested to me I should go football coach method because we have two um, Marks on our panel. So um, this one's for Mark Lobliner. Um, but I would love for you to kind of just walk us through um, MTS Nutrition, which is a strong supplement brand, but you also – recently um, launched the Outright Bar, and which is um, a whole food protein bar. So can you talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the strategy behind launching a specific protein bar and how that kind of, you know, are you targeting a different audience with um, that brand particularly? Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, by the way. This is great. Um, so the thing with the Outright Bar is I formulated it, or I was after this, idea to have a whole food protein bar that doesn't upset your stomach. The thing is with to make a protein bar, to be able to claim the net carbs and all the stuff they claim, they use either glycerin or prebiotic fiber. I don't know about you, but when I take in a bolus of 20 grams of fiber, generally speaking, I'm not going to feel like doing much and I'm probably going to poop myself. So what I wanted to do is have a bar for my kids to be able to eat during soccer tournaments, whatever. So as with most ideas that usually work, it was a very selfish, um, a, a very selfish quest. I hate to use that word. A very selfish mission 
to come out with a bar that can not only be enjoyed by kids around soccer tournaments, soccer games. My kids will play four games. My daughter runs about seven miles per game. There's no way she's going to be able to eat a standard protein bar. And then we'd have like Cliff and we have Z bar. We buy those by the caseload. But again, what you do is you'd literally have a carb spike. There's no protein or fat to blunt that. And, you know, they balk middle of the middle of the game. So I literally was on a three-year mission to find something that would work. And what I found just from a marketing standpoint, just looking at the bar category is just like any industry, just like politics. You look at politics, went from, you know, you went from Jimmy Carter to Ronald Reagan. You went from Barack Obama to Trump. People go back and forth and trends change. We usually go from one extreme to the other. And what we had at first is we had the power bar, which were basically, they tasted like crap, but they made you perform better. They were magical. Everybody thought if you ate something that tasted that bad, it's got to make you good at something. And then we had a brilliant breakthrough with the detour bars, the oh yeah bars, the bars that were these layered dessert bars that literally tasted like dessert. It was basically a candy bar with protein added in it and a little bit of glycerin and stuff to kind of keep the macros somewhat in check. And then Question One did a great thing by revolutionizing the industry and making these bars not only taste, you know, not, I, I'd say I did prefer the layered bars taste-wise, but made it taste comparable to the layered bars, but they were able to have this net carb claim, which, I mean, we could debate all day long the science of if carbs are carbs or you have net carbs, but whatever it was, it worked. And as you mentioned earlier, the acquisition of Quest for a billion dollars, one selling for $397 million, they, are, they legit did some fantastic things. So what I saw is people were more interested in real whole foods, um, stuff they could eat that make them feel good, that can not only act as a snack during the day that'll augment their protein without too much protein. Because again, with our market, I mean, we were talking about this a bit earlier. It was mentioned in the initial slides. With our market, you know, our, our consumer has, it started in the niche because that's where MTS Nutrition is. MTS Nutrition started as a house brand for Tiger Fitness. Talk about the direct consumer route. Went more mainstream, but outright seeing its main growth in SEF. It's seeing its main growth in gas stations, convenience stores, grocery stores. You know, Giant Eagle, HT Hackney, a large C-store and gas station distributor. So we're seeing a huge um, spillover. But we're also seeing our consumer base change where it mainly started as mostly male, went to a male-female mix. And now we have men, women, children, everybody kind of covering it. So it's, it's a good case study of a niche kind of spilling over into the mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of those, super packed protein bars um, can, you know, you see them near the over the counter or OTC aisle in drugstores. Mm -hmm. And you don't really think to go there for nutrition necessarily, but this migration of bars into just the regular snacks category has been fascinating to watch. And, um, you know, Mark Samuel, I would love to get your perspective on this because, you know, I want organic, um, uh, started out in GNC and vitamin shop, but you've really gone into conventional retail. So um, can you talk a little bit about your products and why you saw a home for them in just a regular grocery stores? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. This is Mark Samuel. I went organic. Um, my, my story is similar to Mark, uh, Mark L's. Um, you know, it, it should always start from a passion play. Um, I've eaten a, a sort of a balanced nutritional profile uh, diet for the last 20 years. So, you know, every meal or snack that I have is going to have a balance of, of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And um, I, the bar market, as, as powerful as it is, and as you guys have been talking about, the growth that's there and that will continue to be there, in my opinion, I just didn't really want to play in that realm. I actually wanted to look at something that was on the savory side. So the first opportunity was, you know, in a chip type of product. Um, and over the last, uh, you know, 18 months or so, we have, you know, added on a protein puff. And then our, our most recent product, which is our protein sticks, which is our, our number one seller right now. So, um, you know, I was looking for something in the salty snack category. Um, I was also looking for something that was whole food. So all of our products are are made from uh, plant-based proteins like peas, beans, and brown rice. Um, so everything is sort of derived from that whole food. Uh, we use a little bit of isolate that, that's going to increase the protein 
uh, count by a couple grams per serving, uh, but those are also isolates that come from uh, peas or brown rice. So, you know, the sentiment actually, again, speaking on Mark L., uh, who articulated it properly, which is I cannot eat those types of foods or bars um, that have the high fiber count that come from places that he mentioned. Um, they just disrupt, you know, my stomach, and I'm sure they do many others. Um, I'm also really big into just the concept and idea of whole food. Um, so, you know, we've had a really great opportunity to be able to, you know, launch a product into great partners like a GNC and vitamin shop. We're having, you know, great success there. But the, the big play for us is where we're going right now, uh, which is we have launched, of course, uh, our five-ounce option, which, of course, is going to be perfect for the salty snack category in the places that we see is going to be our biggest opportunity, which is going to be natural and conventional grocery. So uh, we've launched in some independents in California that we have some success with, Central Market in Texas. Uh, and then we are launching, and actually in one week, uh, is our first launch in Whole Foods in Southern California. So, you know, our, our opportunity and our real big mission behind that is to get into the mass consumer market and offer them better for you snacks uh, that are similar and have the same taste and texture of things that they're used to. Uh, we're very used to as consumers, you know, chips and even, even puffs of today, but they're often derived or made from, um, from sources that aren't going to give you the nutritional impact. And that's where we come in. And, you know, one thing to note here, which is kind of, you know, going to, uh, you know, disrupt the conversation a bit, which is our protein counts are what I would call uh, the middle of the road. So our servings, you know, on a one ounce serving, it could be seven or eight grams of protein. And the reason is, is because I don't know if it's touched on yet, but we don't really have a protein deficit here in the state. Um, I can see that protein is a big talking point, and um, Josh, uh, you know, definitely made, gave us the numbers behind it. We're going to continue to see that people are looking for better-for-you options, oftentimes using these, these uh, buzzwords like protein, but we don't have mm -hmm. a protein deficit. We eat plenty of protein here in the state. Uh, where we do have a deficit is in fiber. We don't eat enough vegetables. So, you know, for us, I mean, again, this is just a, a true passion play. We're, we're on a big, you know, big mission here to offer better for you snacking opportunities to, uh, you know, to the whole family. Um, and, again, it's kind of like what, what Mark L. was mentioning, you know, everybody from, you know, those who are into fitness and understand what protein and carbohydrates and fiber does for you to those that are looking to, to improve their diet or their nutrition um, and eating habits, all the way down to kids. I have two young kids also under five, and um, you can be sure that they're getting uh, the puffs in their, in their lunchbox rather than the other stuff that's being offered in the market today. So that, that's where we're at. We're, we're on a, you know, we, uh, we really are enjoying what we're doing right now. Yeah, and um, thanks for bringing up the, the protein point there because um, you're, yeah, there is a lot of conversation around protein and but, you know, protein functions with other nutrients as well. And, you know, we heard from Mark L about, you know, the balance of um, the right sugars and the right carbs and all of that. Um, so kind of uh, getting off of protein here, I want to really um, pull you in here, Jared, because I know we've been talking a lot about protein, but you're addressing part of the sports and fitness market that is really crucial in regards to hydration. And um, I know that when you launch NUMA, really you're – you were going against some category leaders um, as far as Gatorade, Powerade, the likes of those. Um, could you just talk a little bit about what NUMA is and, um, you know, why you decided that we needed a clean label sports drink? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, first, thanks for having me on and happy to be able to share the panel with uh, some other smart people who are kind of, you know, all thinking in the same way of how we can look at things a little bit differently. And that's really what my brother and I and our business partner did with NUMA. Um, again, similar story. We had 
personal problems. I was getting acid reflux and upset stomach issues from the traditional sports drinks I got, you know, as, as an athlete, um, as a hockey player, uh, couldn't really find anything out there that we liked. Um, my brother was a little ahead of the curve on, Hey, maybe, you know, even though we are athletes, 40 grams of sugar every, every, every hour on the hour isn't the best thing for us. Um, and we couldn't find anything that we liked. And that was the initial idea was to develop a product that didn't have these preservatives, clean up the ingredient label a bit. Um, and as we looked at our own diet and nutrition habits and kind of matched that with what we saw was going on out there, um, Numo definitely evolved um, from the beginning into to what it is now over the course of the first couple of years that, as you mentioned, it is now using organic and real ingredients to get that functionality um, as opposed to any artificials, it's definitely no preservatives, even mineral blends. It was how can we deliver these electrolytes that are needed for hydration um, and something that naturally has, has it just by existing. And so for us, it's organic coconut water um, and uh, Himalayan pink salt to give you those electrolytes. Um, so, you know, we used to get the questions all the time is I see this ingredient here, where does that mineral or powder blend come from? Um, and we just saw a big need from people to simplify labels yet there was still the want and need for functionality. Um, and that was something that it took us some time to really figure out um, and definitely bringing that together with it actually tasting good. Um, but that macro level trend of customers are continuing and wanting more and more functionality and, and possibly even stacked functionality. And at the same time, they are becoming more and more label, label readers across the board. And for us, it, how can we provide something effective um, with an ingredient label that you can understand that doesn't have to have all of the extras um, as part of it? Um, and then for us in particular, making sure that the sugar and calories were lower and at a, a level that we really liked, one just from that sense of, hey, we don't need all these extra sugars and cows. And again, kind of a side topic of, you know, carbohydrates to fuel, but is that actually smart? That's kind of what we've been told over and over. Um, I don't think 40 grams of simple sugars is going to really actually help you in the long run um, as an athlete, but also to keeping those sugar and cows low to help the absorption of those electrolytes to help your body get what it needs to perform the best. And so, um, yeah, a little full circle, it was, again, uh, an issue for us and a way that we can actually think a little bit differently than what was currently out there um, and, and maybe target some people that shared those same types of views as opposed to the traditional um, sports drink market. Yeah. And, you know, what I'm hearing from all of you is this consumer base that's kind of rising up here that maybe doesn't, has never been in a CrossFit gym in their life, but they do care about fitness and they, they do care about their health, but um, maybe aren't tracking their macros as, diligently as some other people might. So um, I'm hoping someone can kind of touch on, and this is open to anybody here, but who is the sports and fitness consumer? Um, are we pigeonholing them by calling them a sports and fitness consumer? Um, but what has uh, the approach been to reaching this consumer? And I don't know, maybe Joshua, you have a, a unique perspective into this because you've worked with so many brands and helping them strike the right tone um, but who do you see as the real market and like kind of the profile and of today's sports and fitness consumer? Yeah, I think that the categorical kind of definitions have been stripped away a lot. The kind of the silos we want to put this in, if it's, you know, sports and fitness or um, beauty or whatever other kind of category of, of consumer packaged goods are now a lot more blended together. And I think that that is, a lot around consumer demand and them asking for a lot more out of the products and brands being able to find those um, consumers out in the market because of things like social media or just the internet in general, being able to target um, your customer base is a lot easier. So it's creating a lot of really unique mashups in terms of uh, brand creation, product creation that is being driven by the consumer. The consumer no longer is just some hardcore 
um, fitness uh, person anymore. It's a lot of people that are trying to just uh, be a lot more healthier, be a lot, um, make better decisions in their lives and try to add these products in to um, help them with that lifestyle change. And it's definitely um, across the board. I think generationally, um, a lot of people will focus uh, these categories, they focus on millennials. But if you look at generational data, I think across all boards, um, there is a, a ton of use in all of these products. Um, so I don't, I think that categorizing or kind of putting, um, you know, kind of labels around the consumer is tough today because there's a lot of brands um, that are making a ton of money by um, creating some very unique products and um, just brand stories that are attracting consumers that would never be, I guess, traditionally considered uh, buyers of these products. I got, uh, this is Mark yeah. Samuel. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing about the fitness landscape, I mean, I'm a lifelong fitness enthusiast. I know there's a couple people on this panel that are. The landscape has changed into more of a community-based environment. When, when CrossFit started, um, you know, it created this community that looked different than, than, than before. And nowadays we have uh, Orange Theory uh, here in the Bay Area. There, there's Barry's Boot Camp. And then there's, you know, F45. I mean, there's a lot of these group fitness platforms that are bringing in a whole, whole new demographic. And I, and I love it. I'm a huge advocate for, for people to just get up and get out and go. And that just means get and find anything that you, that, you, that you can enjoy. You don't need to do CrossFit. You don't need to be a bodybuilder. You don't need to, you know, you get out and walk around. That's great. But because of these new platforms, you're pulling all these new demographics. And there are ways for you to be able to, if this is what you're looking to do, launch a product um, specifically in CPG that's going to be pointed at one of these demographics. And we have, there's data that shows I believe, I mean, RX Bar was a great example of it. It was off the back of, of CrossFit. I mean, specifically because that community is so large, if you are somehow able to get into that community with a product um, that gets supported by it, you've got a pretty big business on your hands. So that's just my take on it, um, just seeing how things have shifted and, and grown in the, in the whole health and fitness community over the past 10 to 15 years. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Mark, Al, do you, I, I'm curious because you're come from a bodybuilding background and um, really intense uh, physical background. So, you know, when you're marketing the outright bar, was that kind of new territory for you a little bit? And how did you strike the right balance and reach the people that maybe you weren't reaching before with some of the supplement products you had? You know, we've, uh, if you based, it's, it's going to be really hard to pay your bills selling to the bodybuilding market. It's never been that lucrative. Now I say that, and l let me, let me expand on that a little bit further is that the people who buy our products don't necessarily look like bodybuilders. You know, if you go to any gym at 6 PM, there's our market. What's there? The guy who just worked nine to five behind a desk, the construction worker, the college kid. So your market expands further. Now what we saw with what we did going into this market is that a lot of our market is not like I am not the consumer. And I even say that with MTS nutrition, the shirts I wear, generally speaking, our average consumer can't wear these shirts. Like I wear them. They're going to buy them bigger. They're going to buy them baggier because they don't have a great physique, but they're, they're actually working on getting that physique. They have goals in mind. They set those goals. And you look at our industry, it's beautiful people, you know, um, Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. Somehow I've gotten by. But you look at magazines and you look at the old back when people bought magazines, look at muscle and fitness. Now you look at social media and these influencers and it's beautiful people. I think our consumer knows, okay, they're in a different league, but they strive to be like them. Now with the outright bar, it's different because I kind of, as I went, I kind of reacted and learned as I went, even though my background was in marketing, we noticed that, Hey, you know, a lot of our consumers, a lot of these women, who are our consumers, a lot of these men, they have kids. The kids automatically were like, wait, I can eat these? These are delicious. So once we had kids taste them, and kids love them, you know, once we went to soccer clubs, and kids are literally, like, begging for these bars after soccer games. And we knew we were onto something special. So you, you definitely have a different um, market than you did before because of social media and because of how we can get out there. And not even social media, 
but just electronic advertising. Back in the day when I started, I worked for Weeder Publications, American Media, for, four, for over four years. And you targeted your ads based on your publication. If I wanted to get mass younger men, I'd go to Maxim. If I wanted to get a very endemic niche guy who wants to get big at all costs, I'm going to go into Flex Magazine. I'm going to go into Muscle Mag. Um, maybe I'll go into Men's Health if I have something like the organic products that my colleague on the call is, uh, is speaking of. However, with this bar, there's such, there's such spillover. And so I think that if you're looking at targeting a market, um, I think it might actually, with social media the way it is, you can target things much more efficiently now with Facebook ads. And I think that, that dives into some other things that we can speak of, and that is the nature of marketing in any industry is that you can target things much more efficiently with digital advertising than we could ever do with what I started, and that's print advertising. You could get everything down to how much people make a year, where they live. I could target everybody within 10 miles of your house who lifts weights on Facebook right now. So we're in a situation, we've had tremendous return on ad spend with YouTube, um, with testimonials. So you're able to test market and the cost is low. You used to take, you used to have to place your ad three months in advance and then it would hit and then you have to wait three months to get immediate, to get feedback. Now I can literally today decide to do a targeted ad on Facebook and know by 6 p.m. if it worked. So I, I think we're in a very advantageous space for marketers as well as developers and entrepreneurs and inventors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, you know, I think there's a slide there um, from Tom earlier about online reviews and the online community, and I feel like this has been a really strong suit of, you know, what started as sports nutrition 10 years ago, but, you know, has turned it, has, you know, broadened up there. Um, so I'm curious for me to be like, how important is, your online strategy and um, do you live and die by these online reviews? Because some of them, um, I think there is that community and people want to share information. And um, so yes, the online channel, is that kind of your main source of sales at this point? Or are you seeing more movement in physical retail and um, the difference between those two? Is that still for me or is that for everyone else? Do you want me to chime oh, in? Well, you know, <laughs> sure, you can chime in. <laughs> I just, I just spoke too. for a long time. Um, you no, know, I, I think it just depends on the market. Uh, but I do think you're seeing a huge shift towards Amazon and towards online retailers. You're also seeing um, a lot of retailers fall who didn't have the right angle. For example, bodybuilding.com. Like, where have they gone? They, did, they tried to go head-to-head -head with Amazon, and they've completely missed the mark. Then you have the growth of Amazon. Um, TigerFitness.com, which I'm chief marketing officer of, is up 60% month over month this year. So I think it's a matter of finding your proper place and knowing it and staying in your lane and knowing that Amazon is the king. But there's definitely a place for brick and mortar, and that's where these CPG goods come into play. People like to try them there, but then they're going to go buy a case from Amazon. So I think it's, a, it's getting the customer in brick and mortar, and then they're going to naturally, I think, most likely, go to Amazon and see if they can get a deal on it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Josh, what is um, – how about Amazon? Is this something that – what have you noticed about the evolution of Amazon within the sports and fitness category? And um, is it really giving some other um, retailers a run for their money? Yeah, if we're talking specifically, you know, towards more like food and beverage type of items – you're still getting the vast majority of purchasing in store at, um, you know, kind of the closest um, maybe consumption point that some of these products are needed. You know, if you're, if you're talking about maybe a sports drink, a lot of times uh, purchasers are buying those around the events in which maybe they need them. Um, if we're talking protein bars or protein snacks, sometimes that is around maybe hunger or needing something on a uh, road trip or, or something of that nature. So you still have a lot of the purchasing that's happening um, in store. But if we're talking strictly digital, um, Amazon is the main um, driver of, of digital sales for these categories. And that is uh, primarily because it, it's become the default search engine for consumer products as a whole. If somebody is looking for some type of consumer products, be it a sports and fitness type product or, you know, anything in between, 50% 
ish around then go straight to Amazon. They don't go to Google anymore. They don't go to a social media platform. They go straight to Amazon and Amazon is essentially getting more um, site traffic than a lot of the CPG websites. So you have um, that being kind of a consumer behavior that's very hard. It's kind of creating this lock-in behavior where if you are looking for information that you, um, be it reviews or just um, some type of product information that maybe can help you offline um, or you can purchase at that time, it's just creating this environment where people are defaulting to that behavior. And it's kind of a flywheel where you start feeding it and it just starts creating bigger and bigger results that, um, you know, is something that any brand um, owner is, is obviously paying attention to and trying to figure out how do we utilize Amazon correctly in our strategy. This is Mark mm-hmm. Samuel. I have an add on to that. Um, the, the online business, going back to your original question, you absolutely have to have your online business intact. You absolutely have to have that online business generating a, I wouldn't say significant, it needs to be a good percentage of your overall revenue as you grow. If you're looking for, you know, for a p- partnership or whatever you're looking for as the end game, those that are looking at your business are going to look at your online business without a doubt. And it's going to continue that way as, as the Amazons of the world grow. The thing that you can pull from Amazon are things like subscribe and save. How many people have been buying your product and how many of them are now on a monthly renewal with you? The only thing you can get at brick and mortar is the thing that's really important is to find out the velocity. How many units are you actually selling? That's why, and I actually have heard Josh say this, and he's dead on with it, door count means nothing. It means absolutely Hmm. nothing in this business. The velocity when you're in the door means everything. So, there's that, there's that balance that, you know, a CPG company has to go through and really, really be listening to all of those things that are going on. Number one, your online business, is it growing? And if so, are the consumers coming back? And if you're in brick and mortar, go define yourself in a region or in, you know, in 10 stores, whatever it may be that you think is your lowest hanging fruit, and go put your product there and see if it sells and sells again mm-hmm. week over week. That is really, really important. So hopefully, hopefully I, I touched on sort of your original question. Absolutely. And I think that um, that's a really good point to make about, because um, I think so many brands are really, um, can get bogged down with store count. And if you don't have the velocity to support that, it can be a slow and painful death for a brand. Um, and, uh, Tom, I want to pull you in here, too, because I know that Lumina has a ton of, um, you know, data surrounding Amazon and online sales. Um, anything in particular that you've noticed on the importance of the online channel and um, the growth in that area? So what sort of question are you asking for, for the retailer or for the oh. brand? The retailer. So, uh-huh. yes, are you – are the Amazon reviews um, – If we could go back to one of Tom's slides, actually, that would be helpful because I would kind of wanted to reference that. So slide 19, please, um, as far as the online sales. Yeah, so my question would be, are brands experiencing growth online at compared to retail at a faster at a faster rate compared to physical retail? And if that's Um, something that Luna has insight into so we don't catch that's the thing we don't capture sales data uh, from online versus offline so we're capturing everything from the online mm-hmm. zone uh, but what we are no like because I read brand report uh, company reports and everything like but like that to see where the industry is going it's very dependent on the brand with how they manage things uh, some brands have actually I'm not going to name them have tried to go online um, and have just flopped around. Mm-hmm. Uh, they haven't managed to create engagement with consumers. They haven't uh, done advertising properly. They haven't targeted advertising properly, as was mentioned previously. And their products have just sort of failed. Um, online is easier for brands to get into 
because they don't need to worry about getting that, uh, that shelf space. Um, so if you're a newer brand, it's better that way. But it's really dependent long term. Having an online strategy is necessary, um, especially when you're trying to, as I mentioned, consumers are now looking on their phones when they're in a store. Uh, you need something like, uh, what was it, nine different uh, references to something before you consider buying it. So you need mm -hmm. to be getting those in any avenue you can. So online advertising, when people are going through newspapers or uh, social media platforms. So even if they think they can last without the online sales, the online is still going to be a massively important bit of it because consume, that's where consumers yeah. are spending the majority of their time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I imagine there's just so many more um, metrics and behavioral um, stats that you can gain from the online channel. Um, as far as, um, let's see here, ingredients go, we have had a few questions now, so I think it's about time that I pull in some audience questions about different ingredients um, that could be considered, um, I don't know, maybe gaining more prominence. So we've had a few questions about CBD and its role in products. Um, so towards um, the brand owners here or Josh, um, you know, do you see a future for CBD in protein bars and protein or, you know, drinks as well? We see that more and more for a hydration point of view and Jared as well, sorry. Um, CBD, what are your thoughts? Um, and anyone can chime in here. Is this something that you would ever consider adding to your products? Uh, yeah, this is Jared. Um, I think that there's, without a doubt, an appetite for the ingredient um, in a multitude of platforms and delivery. And you, you almost see, you know, for people that were just out at Expo West and Expo East, it's just like there's literally CBD in everything. Um, so there's, Definitely an undeniable, um, again, appetite for the, for the ingredient. Um, you know, there's definitely going to be some shedding of the uh, the outside um, of of what's actually useful for a consumer uh, and the efficacy of it. Um, I'm, we're a little bit in a wait and see kind of situation, kind of in our opinion. Um, but there's definitely going to be some, you know leaders in the clubhouse, quote unquote, of, of what really makes sense. And I think, you know, when I look at it, it kind of reminds me of what happened with caffeine um, and how we just kind of went from a zero category to all overnight. It's a $12 billion category. Um, but at the same time, it is it has a clear occasion for use, talking about caffeine, and you can feel it and it's immediate kind of thing. And and with CBD, I think that there's a lot of noise out there in applications that don't necessarily make sense. Um, and I think that those brands that figure out where it does make sense, where the audience actually wants it and figures out the mechanisms that they want to be using it, um, it's mm -hmm. clearly going to have a wide range of applications, including in, you know, the sports nutri nutrition space, um, probably most naturally centered around recovery um, and, you know, a mental clarity. And, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of athletes um, out there on the higher levels that talk about using it um, to help with, you know, recovering their body and the pain and, and whatnot that can come with some of these more physical sports. So, yeah. 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 I, it seems like the beverage category has been really embracing it lately and it's definitely going to, there'll maybe be a shakeout to see what's going to happen there. Um, the other question we have here about ingredients is sweeteners. Um, and I imagine this is something that's really pertinent to any product development within this category. Um, what kind of sweeteners did you all consider and what kind of sweeteners have done well in your products? And um, maybe Mark L, if you have some thoughts into that and how you balance the protein with the sugar and all of that nutrition? Oh, absolutely. What we did is we went the whole food route. So we used honey um, for our source of sweetener. And also it helps as a binding agent in the bar. So that worked out well for us. We did not use stevia. 
monk fruit or any artificial sweetener. They're actually sweetener free. Um, I find that people are, if you explain the story, and at the end of the day, I don't think people are as sugar conscious as we think they are. It's a buzzword, but when, when people get that into it, they'll probably know that honey is a different, it's not like just putting table sugar in a bar. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. It's fructose, it's low glycemic, and it's a really good, good carbohydrate. It's a superfood. So what I found, you can find negatives on anything. For example, monk fruit is illegal in Scandinavia. So that eliminates that market. Okay, I'm done. I can't sell in Scandinavia. A lot of people don't know that. Stevia has been shown in mainly rodents to decrease male hormones, testosterone. I'm not saying it does. I've never seen anyone with testicular atrophy from having stevia. I like stevia. However, it also has a very licorice-like, not very natural taste. So we want to get away from that. As far as artificial sweeteners, I think for our base, our niche, I think a lot of people are cool with it. You got to look at even though it's a health-conscious market, I would say Diet Coke drinkers are too. And there's a lot of aspartame in Diet Coke. I don't think it's as big of an issue as a lot of the industry experts make it out to be. However, if you can avoid using any sweetener at all, I found that to be one of the secret sauces, so to speak, for our bar, is the fact that it's like, well, what sweetener do you use? Well, nut. It's all, it's all from honey. And they're like, well, wait, honey, does that have sugar? I'm like, yeah, well, let me explain sugar to you. So I think... It is definitely an issue depending on what your market is. For a guy who's consuming whey protein by the, by the bowl full, I don't think he's going to really care um, about, about a lot of that. Mm. If you have more of the natural, and even vegans, you look at vegans, it's completely health conscious. Uh, I, have a, I also own a brand with a couple of partners called Ambrosia, and we are killing it in the plant protein um, in the market with a, a product called Planta. We have Stevia version, and we also have versions that contain sucralose, which by the way, tastes a lot better. Guess which ones outsell the other ones by like, I'm talking, I'm not talking double, I'm talking tenfold. And that would be the sucralose containing version. So even vegan, and you would think that they're, as long as it's not made from an animal, they're okay with it. So my opinion is, it depends on your market. Like, obviously, if you're going RX bar, you're going that kind of that segmented and niche, absolutely stay away from all the sweeteners you can but for most uh, CPG products, I really don't think it's as big of an issue. But my theory was, if you don't have to use any of them. Don't use them at all. Uh, I okay. can say that. This is Mark, this is Mark Samuel. We, um, we launched a cereal that we're reformatting into a, a, a larger uh, offering for Q1. And we went with the natural route, which is we went with natural organic cane sugar. Um, I'm not interested and I'm not a consumer of the other type of sugar or pseudo sugars that are, are out there. Uh, so as long as you can balance the amount of sugar that you're using within your product, then it creates the balanced nutritional profile that consumers should be, at least in our opinion, should be eating uh, day to day. So that, that's our position on, on sugars. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to help support me, make sure you guys hit that thumbs up button on this video. If this is the first time you've been introduced to my videos, would love for you guys to be a part of my community by subscribing to my channel. I upload several videos just like this weekly. And if you guys wanna connect further outside of this platform, I do include all of my social media links down below. I just wanna thank you guys again for your time. Hopefully I gave you some value in return and we'll see you guys on the next video.